Good morning, Professor Reicher. I'm so delighted that you are able to take the time to do this today. Um, and just to introduce myself for the purposes of the recording. So my name is Renee Blow. Um, I'm at Glasgow University and I was serving on the Division of Occupational Psychology uh, conference organising committee and we were very excited in um, the Division of Occupational Psychology Scotland to invite you along to do a special talk on after the referendum at our annual conference earlier this year in January in Glasgow but unfortunately the Scottish weather <laughs> got the better of us. Um, so very delighted to have this opportunity to have this discussion this morning. Yes, well, it was a dramatic weekend. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, getting up early and uh, finding out that all uh, trains in Scotland were were cancelled. And um, I did. I, I thought about driving, but then discovered that the trees were down on most of the roads, so I was uh, I was blocked in. So uh, uh, so so it's nice to be able to uh, to talk to you and to talk about um, you know the psychology of the referendum. Great. Okay, well, so thanks for that. And um, yes, I can remember getting the email from you and I actually couldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> and pe because we'd spent a long time setting up the session mm -hmm. and um, a lot of people were disappointed. And in actual fact, at the start of the conference, there was actually somebody from the back of the room started talking about your session and some people in the room thought that the DOP Scotland had put this guy up to it but no he was some person who was just really interested to hear you speak um, so we decided between us that it would be a good idea to have this recording we've been very uh, grateful to, to Brian to, to do this recording in St Andrews and in regard of the talk um, it's going to be somewhat of a discussion but it's mainly you're going to be pr pr um, presenting us with your um, take on this um, and and talking about you know psychology in general occupational psychology more specifically and in particular the topic of leadership and then talking a bit about social identity um, and maybe we can finish off with um, talking a little bit about what you have to say about the prospects of an independent Scotland but let's just begin. Maybe you could introduce yourself and talk a bit about you as a psychologist and then maybe launch in with your <laughs> your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I'm not an occupational psychologist. I should, I should um, make that clear so people can turn off uh, right at the start. I'm a social psychologist yes. and I've, I've, uh, I've long been interested. The best interested kind. <laughs> well, that's nice for you to say so. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I've long been interested in issues of social identity and various forms of collective action. Mm -hmm. So I've studied a, a series of collective phenomena. I started off doing work on crowds. I've looked at such things as nationalism, or intergroup conflict and hatred, latterly the psychology of tyranny and obedience. And I guess the topic that I've looked at which is most relevant and certainly most relevant for the referendum um, is the topic of leadership. Um, uh, I think uh, leadership is one of those topics which um, goes in and out of fashion. Um, there are times when it's very central, there are times when it's ignored uh, within the discipline. And while it's important in occupational psychology, strangely in social psychology, uh, it's hardly mentioned at all. Um, but before I start talking about psychology, th let me say something about the referendum um, and why um, uh, I was interested in talking about the referendum. And I think for anybody who was in Scotland, I probably don't need to say this, but for anybody who's outside Scotland, uh, it, I think it's worth stressing how it was a remarkable time. Indeed. It really was a remarkable time. Whatever your opinion on the uh, uh, on the outcome, Quite. Uh, it was an amazing time. The only time uh, that for me was comparable in my life was that in 1994 uh, I went for the first time to South Africa. Uh, and it was the period of transition. It was uh, the period of the election campaign. In fact, I was in Cape Town when the ANC launched their uh, election campaign. And there was that thrill about a society in transition, about mm. anything being possible, about everybody being open, about everybody wanting to talk about it. And in Scotland as well, there was, uh, th th perhaps it's being too romantic, but th I think there was a genuine national conversation. Politics was no longer something that just 
academics and nerds talked about. It was something that you would talk about with strangers in the street. I, I recall about a week before the referendum, uh, I went to have my hair cut, uh, and it doesn't take too long to have my hair cut. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and the young woman who cuts it, um, who I've, you know, I've had a few words with about the weather or, or whatever, she launched into this long thing about the referendum, about how normally she wasn't in, wouldn't vote, but this was so important. Uh, it, 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 I mean, the place was, uh, you know, the joint was jumping. I mean, and what and age was she? Oh, she must have been in her mid twenties. So right. Uh, so it was a thrilling time, and of course, it wasn't just that it was a thrilling time. But it, it was that we were talking about an event of historic importance Indeed. that would have uh, impact on the future of the British state, but probably then would raise questions about the uh, about the nature of many states in in Europe and across. The world. So here was this phenomenon of remarkable importance, remarkable significance, and it was be being debated everywhere. You couldn't turn on the telly, you couldn't, um, uh, you couldn't open a newspaper. As I say, you couldn't go to the hairdresser uh, without it being debated. And one of the things that struck me was how, in large part, psychology was missing from the party. It was missing from the conversation. Definitely peripheral. Yeah. And why do you think that was? I mean, why mm. why do people not see the importance mm. of, or the central importance mm. of psychology? Yeah. I think the word central is significant because it, it wouldn't be true to say that psychology was ignored, but psychology was treated as, if you like, the, uh, uh, the peripheral, the trivial. So you would get phoned up and people would say, can you tell us about the impact of the referendum on, on conflicts in families? So you would have had the core business of the news they would have but that's about not trivial is it well, that's not that we wouldn't want to say that okay. conflict in families was no i'm trivial. not saying no i'm yeah. not saying that conflict in, in families is trivial i'm saying that it is somehow peripheral to what was seen as the core debate about right. which, which way the vote would go so uh -huh. so the, the the core issues of the referendum weren't, weren't seen as psychological right but other issues were seen as psychological psychology was i, I don't know if you remember that it used to be i think it was the uh, itv news at 10 would have an and finally yes item which was you know, there to raise a smile psychology played that function. We were missing mm -hmm. from the core of the debate. And I think it has to do with the perception rather than misperception of, of, of psychology in the public domain and amongst journalists in particular. Um, it's not just true of the referendum. There is a sense that when we come to uh, the big social issues, um, you know, it might be in, uh, immigration um, you know, uh, or whatever, then sociology is important and political science uh, is important and, and economics is important. But psychology is seen to be about the individual, uh, about individual interactions, individual relations, individual health and ill health. So these societal issues are not seen as the province of psychology. And so we are left out of these core debates. Uh, now, at one point, I was contacted by a journalist about just such a, uh, if you like, peripheral issue, and I, uh, I lost my cool, and I, I, I sent back this ranting email saying, no, 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 psychology is relevant to the core issues. It's relevant to the, to the center of the debate. And that's what you ought to be writing about. And actually, to a credit, she then gave me the space to write an article about that. But that was uh, an exception. Very much, I think, there is, there is a very serious issue for the discipline as a whole in terms of the ways we are perceived and in terms of, therefore, our exclusion from some of the more important social issues uh, you know, that confront us. And here we are now at this point in history. It's after the referendum. Mm. It's several months after. Mm. And things have moved on quite substantially. Mm. Um, I'm interested to hear your your thoughts with regard to the particular subject of leadership mm -hmm. how well, do you think this played okay well i think leadership is 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 central but let me come at it if if, if i may obliquely okay because in many ways you know, the, the referendum was a classic example of decision making under uncertainty mm, okay. people indeed. had to cast their ballot without fully knowing what the consequences were. Partly, of course, because we can't predict the future, uh, but partly because what the vote would do would be to initiate 
a set of negotiations uh, about such things as what would happen to the national debt, what would happen to the currency. One couldn't know until after those negotiations mm -hmm. uh, exactly what was on the table. So when we were voting, we couldn't be certain about what the outcome would be. Okay. Now, uh, some of the best known work on decision making by Kahneman um, makes the point that the way in which you frame risk is central uh, to uh, the judgments and the decisions we make. Of so, for instance, Kahneman argues we are loss averse. We don't want to lose. So if you frame risk in terms of uh, a probable loss but a possible gain, in other words, uh, risk this loss on the off chance you might do well, then people being loss averse won't buy that. Okay. If, on the other hand, you ask people to take a risk to avoid a likely loss, you know, take a risk uh, in order not for something, uh, for something bad not to happen, people will then um, take that risk. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the fascinating things was how the understanding of risk was reframed between the two key debates between Alex Salmond uh, and Alistair Darling, uh, Salmond leading uh, the yes uh, campaign, Darling uh, leading the no campaign. In the first one, Darling was seen to have come out better mm. because Darling managed to frame things in terms of, look, we don't know about the long term, the long term might be okay, but in the short term, there are bound to be problems. You don't even know what currency you're going to have. So sure. he framed it as a certain short term loss mm -hmm. and the possibility of a long term gain. Mm -hmm. right? Now, once it was framed that way, the no campaign and Darling came out on top. By the second debate, mm -hmm. Salmond reframed things. Uh, what Salmond managed to do was to say, look, in the short term, if we don't vote for independence, there are likely to be losses. Mm -hmm. uh, there are losses in terms of austerity. There are losses in terms of the threat to the NHS. Yes. And then he was arguing that in order to avoid these certain losses, it is worth taking the risk of independence. Okay, And having reframed uh, the way we looked at risk, actually, Salmond was seen to have done relatively well. And that was the beginning of the upswing which made the vote uh, uh, eventually so close. Now, the point then is, on the one hand, of course, we can use our psychological understandings of the framing of risk to get at the core issue of decision-making under uncertainty. But the second point, of course, is that the framing of risk isn't just something that happens. It's not something that uh, occurs by individuals uh, somehow contemplating the world on their own. It comes about through leadership. That what is happening is we are being offered differing understandings of the world, different framings of the world, and the way in which we orient to those differing uh, voices, those differing leadership sources, is critical to the outcomes. And so I would argue that actually, in general terms, when we look at psychological processes, the dimension of leadership, the way in which leaders make sense of the world, <coughs> the way in which they offer us particular ways of looking at the world, is always a critical uh, dimension of how we see things and how we behave. Yes, now that's all uh, making sense and you're drawing on cognitive psychology, but so the thing that I want to ask you about is in terms of leadership, mm -hmm. in what sense do these political leaders lead the people? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we, we think of these leaders as being somehow removed mm -hmm. from people as they go about their general lives mm -hmm. and these leaders perform leadership roles to their own mm -hmm. parties and so on. Mm -hmm. So was there something going on there mm -hmm. well, I certainly that influenced yeah. how people voted in the end? Yeah. Well, the way we look at leadership is that we see leadership as a social relationship of leaders to followers but within a particular social group. Mm -hmm. So our focus is very much one which says, let's look at the broader context of groups, and then let's look at the leader-follower relationship within that. Um, now, if you look at the history of research on uh, leadership, in a way you can see it as, 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 as a widening focus for a long time, and still today, 
there is a view that leadership is just about the leader. Leadership is about particular individuals who have the right stuff. And for many, many years, uh, there have been studies trying to find what that right stuff is. Is it intelligence? Uh, is it um, charisma? Whatever charisma might be. Personality. Yeah. And on the whole, uh, that work has not been desperately successful. That it is hard to find a single quality uh, which marks out the leader from the non-leader across all contexts. Um, and so then the focus was sometimes somewhat widened. It was about leaders and followers. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, uh, you know, either transactions, uh, in other words, uh, a leader is somebody who gives the followers what they want, or we talked about transformational leadership, but that took us back to, you know, qualities of charisma. We argue that to resolve those dilemmas of, of, of the relationship between the leader and the follower, you have got to look at this relationship within a group context. And that starts from a very simple observation, which I think is uh, amply illustrated within the referendum. And that is, a leader is never just a leader. They're always a leader of some social group. They're leader of a party. They're leader of a nation. They're leader of a religion and so on. Mm -hmm. And how you relate to them mm -hmm. is a function of whether you're a member of that group or not. So, for instance, for many people within Scotland, you know, uh, Alex Salmond might have been seen as a Scottish leader and seen uh, in in-group terms and seen quite positively outside Scotland, to the extent you weren't Scottish, um, he was seen very di uh, differently. Often he was seen far more negatively. He was, um, he was burnt in effigy in places like Rye and, and so on. So the way in which we see leadership and the way in which we see particular leaders is a function, number one, of how they relate to the group and number two, of how we relate to uh, the group as well. Can you say a bit more about identity then? Mm. I mean, do you think that it's a matter of national identity? Mm. You know, why why did it work out the way that it did? Mm. And do you think that, maybe we'll just mm. stop there, let you answer that question okay. to begin with. But let me just also talk about, when you were talking about your um, theory of leadership, um, this is a particular um, excellent Book, the New Psychology of Leadership, um, which um, I can highly recommend to anybody who um, has an interest in this area. I'm glad you said that. In all, in all good bookshops. <laughs> <that>, Indeed. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, one of the, the problems with the term identity mm. is the I term identity by now is everywhere. Mm. And it's used in so many different ways that um, that often actually it does more to obscure than to uh, clarify. Right. I mean, it, you know, as people sometimes say of the UK and the US, sometimes everybody uses the language of, of identity, but we're divided by that common language. Mm. Um, and one of the dangers is people uh, put up a very simplistic notion of the way in which identity relates to leadership, knock that down, and then assume that identity is irrelevant. Got um, you. Now, that's also true in terms of the relationship between identity and the referendum. Mm. On the one hand, it's long been known that there is no simple and linear relationship between Scottish identity and support for independence. There's a weak correlation, which is probably because um, you're only likely to favour independence if you're a strong identifier. But on the other hand, you can strongly identify in, with Scotland and think it's in the best of in, uh, interests of Scotland to remain part of Britain. Right. Um, so, actually, in fact, in the 19th century, there was, there was a movement of unionist nationalism, which argued that Scottishness uh, could thrive within the union, and if you were a real Scots patriot, you ought to be fighting for more union rather than less. So, there's not a simplistic relationship uh, between identity and, uh, and support for uh, nationalism. That doesn't mean to say there is no relationship. And, and, and so let me go s through some of the ways in which I think identity is relevant and uh, identity leadership is therefore relevant. Um, the first question is, uh, what identity? Okay, there's an assumption that because it's about a referendum on independence, it must be about national identity. But if you look at the results, what made the results so close 
was not so much the campaign that was on in the media, in the public view of the SNP leading the, the Yes campaign. It was much more grassroots campaigns, specifically in Glasgow and in Dundee, mm. which got uh, disenfranchised working class voters to vote for independence. In a sense, it was the people who felt less left behind by politics as usual in the UK, who saw an alternative, who saw a way of doing politics in which they would actually be, uh, be involved. Now that was much more to do with, if you like, uh, class identity than national identity. People could vote for independence, not because they had some romantic notion of, of tartan and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Scottishness, but much more because they saw a way of ordinary working class people being involved in the political domain. So when we're talking about identity, first of all, let's not just talk about Scottish identity. Secondly, if we're talking about uh, identity, there are identity is not just relevant in a sense to uh, what you're trying to achieve, but who you listen to. Um, and this comes back to uh, an, an issue of leadership. Um, uh, social identity approaches, when they look at social influence, argue that what we are trying to do is to act in terms of the norms and the values which characterise our group. But who is able to inform us and to tell us what forms of actions are appropriate, are normative for us? Um, and most likely there are going to be people who are going to be in-group members. In mm -hmm. other words, a leader, and one of the first things a leader has to do is to characterise themselves as one of us, okay? Uh, somebody who shares our values, who understands our values, who has the same priorities as us. However skilled they are, if they are using their skills in the wrong direction, they're not going to be a particularly appropriate leader. So as I say, leadership depends on being, uh, upon being seen as one of us. And we saw many examples of that uh, in the referendum. Indeed, one of the strong um, uh, motifs of the Yes campaign was the notion that the Yes campaign was uh, Team Scotland, mm. whereas the No campaign uh, was Team Westminster, okay? that, uh, uh, that they were of us. Um, and that was also critical to the issue of trust. Um, uh, one of the big issues in the campaign was about information, that people uh, making claim and counterclaim and counter counterclaim, and who could you believe? Who could you believe? Who could you trust? Now, we know there's plenty of evidence to show it, that trust uh, is very much vested in people who are seen as in-group. We are more likely uh, to trust those who are seen as one of us. So putting those things together, we see a process whereby uh, influence depends upon being seen as one of us, of being trusted, of one's information being seen as more valid, and therefore being able to manage the uncertainties of the campaign uh, more effectively. Sometimes that took, I think, slightly more disturbing uh, aspects because the danger is that if the Yes campaign posed itself as um, uh, Team Scotland, one implication could be that anybody who wasn't a Yes campaigner was not truly Scottish, mm. um, was uh, at worst seen as a traitor. And I'm, I don't want to overstate this, I think it would be wrong to overstate this, but I think there were some elements of that. And there was one moment in the second debate I found particularly uh, problematic, and that was when um, Alex Salmon turned to Darling and said, I, I notice you stress your Scottishness uh, several times. Now, Salmon went on to say, I don't doubt your Scottishness, but why would he have noted that Darling was stressing it unless he was implying that Darling's Scottishness was in question mm. and therefore he had to protest it in particular ways. Mm. I mean, it was a way, I think, of signalling that uh, Darling, not because of you know, his background, not because of anything else, but because of the position he took, was not truly one of us. So there are dangers in these things. So do you think Alex Salmon was wrong to draw that? Yes. Right, because it made him come across as being unfair or no 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 i think one of the, if you make a criterion of inclusion in the nation mm -hmm. uh taking a particular political point of view 
if you say that you are only truly Scottish if you support this point, uh, point of view, then I do think that it, first of all, uh, it, it, it escalates the tension in the debate. I don't think it's helpful in the debate. And secondly, it makes it more difficult to uh, uh, achieve cohesion uh, after the debate. So I think that was an unhelpful uh, aspect of the debate. I don't want to overstate it. Because I would also make the point that actually we had this national conversation about the future of the nation, which had the prospect of change of the nature of the state <coughs> without any violence. You know, uh, people you know, uh, got outraged when, when, when some eggs were thrown at a politician. Now, no eggs should be thrown at politicians, so I'm not supporting that. But I would say that we kind of live in a blessed country where the worst violence we have in debating the very future of, of, of our nation uh, is an egg or two. Comparatively, you know, this was a very civilised debate. So I think we need to get things in balance. But at the same time, I think we need to be aware of some of the dangers of, uh, of using identities in particular ways as, and, and, and to argue that one has to take particular positions to be included in the nation. Okay. And so do you think Salmon was right to resign in terms of, you know, psychologically his leadership role had come to an end? Was that a surprise to you? Uh, I remember Voltaire once said, uh, if you see a Swiss banker jump out of a window, follow him, there's bound to be money in it. Now, now Salmond is one of the cleverest politicians in the UK. You don't have to like him, you don't have to love him, but he is an immensely accomplished politician. And when Salmond uh, resigned, I guess the question in my head was, OK, what's in it for him? Um, and I think that's become clear since that, uh, as that, uh, you know, as the leader of the SNP group in Westminster, uh, and with the prospect of a general election where the SNP holds the balance of power, um, in a sense, Salmond was going off perhaps to get ministerial office at the UK level, or if not to get ministerial office, at least to be a kingmaker in in that context. So no, I think I think Alex Salmond is an immensely accomplished political uh, beast, and I don't think this was an act of uh, uh, resigning from politics. It was an act of resigning from a particular uh, position in the SNP. So coming back to our focus on <coughs> psychology mm. and leadership and identity, what, what claim are you making? Are mm. you making the claim that psychology can help us understand what's going on? Mm. Or are you saying that psychology, if people paid more attention to psychology as a discipline, it might help them in achieving influence and impact in the world? Hmm. I'm making a claim both outwardly and inwardly. Okay. To psychology, I'm making the argument that we, number one, need to take uh, leadership far more seriously. You know, our, our vision of human understanding often is that of individuals sitting in isolation and in silence contemplating the world and making uh, their minds up about the world. I think that's an entirely unrealistic view of the world. It's a, it's a view of what we do to people in laboratories in controlled studies, but actually in the real world we live in, you know, in, in a cacophonous world of multiple voices. And actually, I think uh, understanding is far more a matter of how we orient to those different voices uh, than it is about silent contemplation. So that's an argument of the centrality of leadership in understanding human perception and understanding in general. Um, it, it's saying, in a sense, that uh, a perceptualist view, I think, um, doesn't give us a very rich picture. And we need to look much more about the mobilization of uh, understanding, and mobilization uh, clearly involves leadership. Looking outwards, I do think that psychology provides us insights into the nature of leadership and insights into uh, how leadership can effectively uh, be performed. Um, uh, 
there is, of course, a huge industry about leadership, and there are many, many uh, training courses in leadership, uh, one way or, or another. Uh, one thing very few of them do, however, is to include followers um, mm. in that in that process of evaluation. The critical thing about good leadership is how you are seen by followers. It's about um, how they are motivated, not how you are motivated. What great leadership does, actually, is not um, uh, involve the agency of the leader, him or herself, so much as mobilizing the agency of followers. There's a, there's a great uh, Brecht uh, poem we, we cite in the book where, where Brecht asks, you know, who, who erected the pyramids? Was it the pharaohs or was it the workers? You know, who wins battles? Is it the generals or is it the soldiers? It is, it is mobilizing the agency of others that is critical. And how do you do that? You don't do that by domination. You don't do that by, in a sense, telling people what they should do. You don't do that by imposing your will on people. The way you do it is to be part of a collaborative and collective enterprise of what you work to do is to clarify what we believe in, uh, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. In that way, you get people to want to do these things. In that way, you get them to do them even when you're not there, standing over them, telling them what to do or threatening them with a stick and so on. And that's all, that sounds right. It sounds, it sounds like it makes sense. Mm. But what happens when a conflict emerges mm. between the leader and the followers? Mm. I'm thinking about the, the, the deposing of Margaret Thatcher. Mm. Um, you know, arguably a great leader mm. Mm. in some respects, mm. but yet it came to a point where she mm. was essentially got rid of. Well, this is a point at which we would argue that traditional models of leadership aren't only wrong, they are counterproductive. <laughs> what they do is they, they convince the leader that their successors come down to them and them alone. Mm. So what you often find, and you find it actually, I think probably an even better example is Tony Blair than Margaret Thatcher, you find a trajectory of leadership. At the early stage, people understand that their uh, success and their influence comes from followers. They listen to followers. Yes. They listen to what they have to say. They are able to represent a popular view. So Blair's touch in 1997, say around the death of Diana, was was a superb touch. He was seen yes. to speak for us far more than, say, the monarchy. Yes. But the danger is that the more successful you are, mm. you are led to believe it's because you are brilliant. <laughs> and then you are led to believe that actually you don't need to listen to anybody else because you know better. And gradually you become isolated. And gradually you speak for yourself. And gradually you ignore others. And therefore hubris um, destroys you. And I think that trajectory, as I say, is, is very clear in the case of Blair as well as Thatcher. And it makes the point that an effective leader is only an effective leader to the extent that they are seen to speak for us. Once they are seen to speak for themselves, once they are seen to impose themselves on us, um, then we have problems. Now, actually, at the moment, we have a wider problem, which is only, uh, isn't only about individual politicians, it's about the political class. Mm. We increasingly have a sense, not that a politician is, in a sense, one of ours. You know, so Labour think of a politician not as a politician, but as Labour and Conservative as Conservative. We think of them as all the same. The expenses <laughs> that Gandal says, politics as uh, politicians in general form a category which is outgroup, at yeah. which point they have less um, uh, influence. Those are the conditions where you begin to get populism and populist leaders who claim to represent, you know, the ordinary person, yes. you know, Nigel Farage with his, with his pint of beer and, and so on. So there is a real danger in these anti-political times of the rise of, uh, 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 you know, of, of, of authoritarian populist leadership. Mm, mm. That's very interesting. Mm. So I think we're getting towards the, the end of our mm. discussion. Um, What's your kind of final thing? Imagine you're at the conference right now and you're just the last few minutes of your talk. Yeah. What would you say, um, 
you know, if the if your talk had taken place in January, it's very interesting. Mm. We're now having this conversation now in March. Things mm. have moved on even since then. Mm. What do you see going forward? Maybe that's the wrong question to ask. Mm. Maybe you'd rather sum up with something um, sophisticated about the fact that you know the world should take psychology seriously and psychologists should get their house in order mm. well I, i'm going to say I, I do find it frustrating when we have a series of debates uh about actually about uh human behavior and about uh psychological issues where psychology is ignored mm. uh, i do think we need to think very seriously about how uh, we interface with uh, journalists, how we interface with the general public in order to get an understanding of the relevance of psychology to social issues. Um, so that would be the first message uh, w w which I would want to get over. And I know I'm not alone in saying that. In fact, um, yeah, there are various groups uh, trying to deal with uh, particularly uh, this. Um, the second thing is, actually, I think psychology um, is remarkably powerful. Um, I think psychology gives us an understanding of how to uh, create and how to generate and how to mobilize social power. You see, if people in groups act in terms of group identities, act together in group identities, it means that if you understand the processes of making yourself representative of a group, of being seen to act for a group, then you have a tool, a world-making tool in your uh, hand. Um, now that of course raises another very serious question, which is how do we make sure that that is done responsibly? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with who do we want to be uh, in dialogue with and who do we want to use our skills for uh, in terms of wielding that power? I, I worry when that becomes one-sided. So for instance, I worry when, for instance, uh, you know, psychology and work on leadership uses its tools and its skills purely on the side of management uh, to get management to be able to influence uh, the workforce rather than uh, on the side of the workforce in order to allow them to, uh, to work for fairer and better and more humane conditions. So I think the more powerful we are, uh, the more responsible we are and the more questions we must ask about our orientation to different social groups in society. Oh, that's a wonderful place to finish. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good to talk to you.